morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, your presence. I'm joined, of course, by our distinguished vice chair, Catherine Clark. Uh, the best thing that can be said about the president's speech is that it's over. Donald Trump has left the building, and now we can get back to doing the business of fighting for the people. House Democrats have been very clear that we have an agenda that's focused on working families, middle class folks, senior citizens, the poor, the sick, the afflicted, and veterans. House Democrats have been very clear that we're focused on lowering health care costs, increasing pay for everyday Americans through a real infrastructure plan, and cleaning up corruption and the mess that the other side of the aisle has created. It appears tangentially, based on Donald Trump's speech, that he agrees with parts of the House Democratic agenda, particularly as it relates to lowering health care costs and a real, meaningful, bipartisan infrastructure plan. House Democrats believe that we should lower health care costs, beginning with a focus on driving down the high cost of life-saving prescription drugs. House Democrats want to give Medicare the ability to use its bulk price purchasing power to negotiate lower drug prices on behalf of the American people. House Democrats have a $1 trillion infrastructure plan that we believe will fix our crumbling bridges, roads, tunnels, airports, and mass transportation system, and also create 16 million good-paying jobs. House Democrats are going to continue our focus on kitchen table pocketbook issues. The President briefly talked the talk. Now it's time for us to walk the walk together. House Democrats have an ambitious agenda on lowering health care costs and on a real infrastructure plan, and we look forward to working on these issues in a bipartisan fashion. Let me now yield to our distinguished Vice Chair, Catherine Clark. Thank you, Hakeem, and thank you all for being here. The President certainly covered a lot of ground last night. He told a story of shared ideals and unity. But in reality, he's distorted the impact of his own policies and actions and advocated for policies that are rooted in the past and omitted issues that Americans have ardently called for Washington to address. He proclaimed support for an economy that works for everyone, but failed to mention the $2 trillion debt caused by his tax bill that favors corporations and wealthy people over working Americans. He talked about working families in this country, but failed to mention those workers are facing stagnant wages, increasing costs of childcare, and housing. He called for protecting those with pre-existing conditions, but I did not hear him call to end the lawsuits attacking the ACA and would upend those protections for pre-existing conditions and other protections for families in that bill. He trumpeted our continued reliance on oil and coal, but never mentioned climate change or the real threat to national security that it poses. He spoke of the importance of mothers having precious little time with their children. And I, too, would like to pass a family paid leave policy. But he never mentioned separating families at the border. I hope to work with him on eradicating AIDS and HIV, but this is in total contrast to the policies that he has put forth that threaten the LGBTQ community and his assault on Title X funding that in 2016 alone would provide more than 4 million people with testing, including HIV. The President spoke about the tragedy in Pittsburgh. He brought two survivors of that incredible um, tragic events that unfolded at the Tree of Life Synagogue. But 
he never talked about gun violence in this country and what we are going to do about it. My guest at the State of the Union was a student activist named Angie. She was so devastated after Parkland that she joined a national walkout and brought 900 students with her. Um, that was just missing from the State of the Union and the speech last night. Democrats are moving forward on our For the People agenda, and we will be holding our first hearing on gun violence today, uh, the first one in eight years. Our message to the President and the American people is clear. Our policies will strengthen all communities and lift up every American, and that is what you should expect from your government and this Congress. So thank you, and we will uh, open it up to questions. Well, there's a bipartisan process that's underway that we believe is working well. House Democrats are prepared uh, to support 21st century border security. We've reiterated that and put a robust proposal on the table. We're willing to invest in increased infrastructure, particularly along our legal ports of entry, which, by the way, are the primary means by which contraband and narcotics come into the United States of America. We're willing to invest in additional personnel, particularly as it relates to customs agents, which are understaffed right now, as well as immigration judges, which the administration has agreed to support. We're also willing, of course, to invest in additional technology, such as sensors, drones, satellites, uh, scanners, and the things that the experts have said will increase border security. As long as the president is willing to accept evidence-based proposals, then I think we can arrive at a bipartisan agreement. If the president is only interested in funding a reckless political promise with respect to a medieval border wall that will be ineffective in improving our security, then we're going to have an issue. Well, based on the information that has been provided to us by Chairwoman Lowy, uh, the Democrats and the Republicans, the House and the Senate are working closely together. Uh, I remain cautiously optimistic, but I'm not going to get ahead of the process that they've uh, set forth. But hopefully the lesson has been learned that shutting down the government is not a legitimate negotiating tactic. Catherine. Yeah, I, I think part of the concern comes from, not from the process that we're undergoing in Congress, which I think is we are coming together in a bipartisan way to look at what really can improve national security. But when you have the President talking about the Democratic proposals in one part of his speech, you know, strengthening our ports, making sure we have more personnel, using technology, and then he veers off in misinformation about El Paso that it was one of the most dangerous cities until they built a wall. That is simply not accurate information. But if the president remains committed to data-driven, effective border security measures, I think we will have an agreement. And we're certainly hopeful that the $11 billion hit to our economy from this shutdown is a, a lesson and an occurrence that this president does not want to repeat. Go across the second row. Thanks. Well, the House is a separate and co-equal branch of government. We have an Article I responsibility to serve as a check and balance on an out-of-control executive branch. We take that Article I constitutional responsibility seriously. We will not be bullied by the President of the United States. The days of the House functioning as a wholly owned subsidiary of the Trump administration are over. 
That ended on January 3rd. That said, we're not going to overreach. We're not going to overinvestigate. We're not going to over-politicize our constitutional responsibilities. The House is going to proceed uh, with restraint, with regular order, and that's why hearings will take place, including the one on exploring taxes related to the president and the vice president before any action is taken. Our major priority is lowering health care costs, leading with reducing the high price of prescription drugs, a real infrastructure plan, and cleaning up corruption. We have supported enhanced fencing where appropriate in the past. I think that uh, we expect that if the evidence supports the notion for enhanced fencing moving forward, that you will find some bipartisan consensus in that regard. It's not appropriate for me to get out ahead of what the particulars are in terms of the negotiation because that's a process that has been put in place and we've all agreed to respect it. I think it goes without saying that some sort of physical barrier or medieval border wall from sea to shining sea is outrageous, ridiculous, and is not evidence-based. What we do know about the southwest border is that there are parts that are mountainous terrain and or uh, enveloped by bodies of water, particularly around the Rio Grande Valley. There are parts of the border that are privately owned and would require eminent domain that neither side seems to support at this moment. There are also parts of the border that are sacred Native American land, and it will be wholly inappropriate and perhaps a violation of their sovereignty to try to impose some sort of medieval border wall to fulfill a campaign applause line. Those are just facts. And what we've said is that our approach to border security in totality should be evidence-based. The House Democratic Caucus supports a well-regulated free market economy that is also anchored in a robust social safety net, including Social Security and Medicare. Uh, we, as House Democrats, support what I would term compassionate capitalism that is based on an emphasis of the well-being of working families, middle class folks, senior citizens, the poor, the sick, and the afflicted. Donald Trump apparently supports crony capitalism, and Exhibit A is the reckless tax cut where 83% of the benefits went to the wealthiest 1% in the United States of America. We don't support crony capitalism. We do support compassionate capitalism that looks out for everyday Americans. You know, I, I'd just like to add one of the things that was really notable that it was missing was there was just the briefest mention of the infrastructure investment. And that is one of the ways that Democrats, and we hope the White House will join us, is looking at creating good jobs and increasing wages by investing in America again and investing in infrastructure. And for the president just to leave that out of his speech, not address uh, that at all, in, except in the most glancing way, really stood out to me as an omission. Heather? Well, it's not clear to me that 
he will or he will not testify. I do think that House Democrats are compelled to make sure that all of the information as appropriate make it into the public domain so that the American people can decide for themselves, did the Russians attack our democracy with the aid and comfort of members of the Trump campaign? That's a legitimate question. And I think we all have a responsibility to our democratic republic to make sure that we get the answers. Part of that responsibility is gonna be to protect the Mueller investigation. The other part of that responsibility as a separate and co-equal branch of government is to make sure that the information is aired in an objective and appropriate and non-sensationalized fashion to the American people. Catherine uh, will speak to that as well, but I think when we arrived into the United States Congress together as part of the class of 2012, uh, John Dingell was one of those legendary members uh, who's an institutionalist who's done great good for the people that he represented for decades in Michigan and in his capacity as a dynamic chair of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, our thoughts and prayers continue to be with uh, John Dingell and Debbie Dingell, uh, as well as the Dingell family and all the people that have supported him throughout the years. And I think he will go down uh, in history as one of the most impactful members of the United States Congress. And he's a great tweeter as well. <laughs> yeah, I, I have uh, spoken to Debbie and been in contact with her. And as Hakeem said, our thoughts and prayers are are with her and with John. Um, and one of the first meetings I had when I came into Congress five years ago was to meet with John Dingle, uh, which was a little intimidating, but in a very John Dingle way, he welcomed me into his office and said, you are as welcome as spring, uh, which I always will remember. And really his message to me was always look at the wide Democratic caucus and what it takes to build a majority and find those issues where we can come together despite our different perspectives and where we are on the ideological spectrum. Remember that it's that commitment to American families and to equality that drives Democratic values and always look for that in your fellow Democrats and honor that. And those are words that I think I'll, I'll never forget. And I think we really saw that in display in the midterms. And that's very much uh, a, a legacy of John Dingell. Time for two more questions. We'll go to the back and then uh, for for. Well, this accuser and any accuser deserves due process, an opportunity to be heard, as well as the opportunity to be treated with the dignity and respect through a process that will be put in place in order to figure out what happened. That said, uh, with respect to uh, the dynamics as it relates to whether the governor stays or goes at this point, uh, the Virginia congressional delegation appears to continue to be speaking in one voice, and I stand behind their position. There's an emerging bipartisan consensus that shutdowns are a reckless negotiating tactic and should never again be used uh, when there is a legitimate dispute between different branches of government. Those disputes should be worked out by us trying to find common ground, not by shutting down the government or threatening a national emergency. With respect to legislation to end the practice of shutdowns, uh, there are bills that have been either introduced or in the process of being discussed. We all believe that this should be done in a bipartisan way. 
and we're at a very preliminary stage of having those discussions and working out the particular legislative vehicle that we should employ. Thanks, everyone.